I'm the Antarctica guy around here, okay? This is it. Part two of bizarre creatures found in Antarctica. You loved Antarctica facts that much that you came back. Thank you, let's do it. Some more facts coming in hot. Number 10, sand hoppers. Sand hopping in Antarctica? Get out of town. A sand hopper sounds like something from the movie Dune. These amphipod crustaceans can be found more often than not near shores, but also in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. They eat decaying or dead material. I mean, just, just by looking at them, you can tell that they eat leftovers. They're around one meter long to a few inches long. They're tiny little buggy dudes. They're pretty unique as well. When we think of the bottom of the food chain, we don't connect beauty with them a lot, right? These sand hoppers can come in many different shapes, sizes, and even colors. Some are pale, some are camouflage, some are bright red. They're all unique New Yorks. Look at them go. Number nine, ice fish. Fish that are icy. Yes, here we go. Now we're back on track. This makes much more sense for Antarctica. Ice fish didn't get their name because they live in a place full of ice. They literally are the most cold-blooded creature on the planet. As aside from your ex, of course. They can adapt their body temperature to the water and stay cold. They stay frosty, my friends. If they encounter warm water, God forbid, well, they simply won't survive. It's chilly waters or bust for ice fish. If you're wondering how they swim around without literally freezing solid, it's because, well, similarly, to the fish that we had on part one, these two create glycoproteins, which is a natural antifreeze, if you will. That's why they don't have chunks of ice hanging off of them, just weighing them down all day. They have a natural antifreeze, but no hemoglobin, so their blood is white. So underwater, they just look like nothing, really. Invisible ice fish. Yeah, this place is wild. Number eight, narwhals. The unicorn of the sea. Are these things real? I have never seen one before. But to be fair, I don't spend a lot of time in Arctic waters, so... That makes sense. My last name has waters in it, but I don't really like the water, you know? Nor do I have a horn growing out of my head, so I don't belong anywhere near these guys. Narwhals can grow up to 17 feet in length. Their horn is mighty tusk, rather. They're one single head tusk. I like saying horn because it's majestic. It reminds you of unicorns, right? And narwhals are majestic. More often than not, males will grow the tusk, and female narwhals have these tiny little tusks. Scientists still can't explain the reason behind a narwhal's tusk in the first place. Why is it used? I mean, so far, we believe it's to impress females. Females. That's our main guess. Or hunt other males. Yeah, we got narwhals jesting in the ocean for love. A lot happening over in the uh, Arctic. Number seven, walrus. Yeah, since we're on the topic of tusks, why not? These guys are also pretty bizarre when you really think about it. They have massive tusks coming out of their face. And I recently watched that horror movie with Justin Long called Tusk, and now I can't look at a walrus ever again the same. Duh. These arctic creatures have some odd patterns. Their abilities are also extremely underrated. Their tusks can reach three feet and they use them to hoist themselves out of the water. Yeah, they bite into the ice and then pull their fat bodies out. I can't even bite ice cream. Imagine using your teeth to get out of the ocean. Ugh. That's athletic, man. Walrus can also slow their heart rate down in order to save energy. That's also pretty neat. They have fantastic abilities to adapt, but humans, we almost sent these beautiful creatures into extinction. Classic. Classic humans just getting involved, wanting to take a look. Walrus hunting is now illegal for the most part, aside from a few areas. So these blubbery boys still have a fighting chance. But historically, a walrus have never attacked a human ever. So don't be afraid of them. They don't want any beef, just fish. Number six, snailfish. Another fish, another fun fact. There's around 400 types of snailfish in the frigid depths of the Arctic. The frigid depths of the Arctic. Why did I write, I write myself tongue twisters. Now, of course, there are many that haven't even been discovered yet, which is always fun. Thankfully, we have researchers take on these daring expeditions, like the secrets of Antarctica, for example. This documentary is breathtaking, and it's on YouTube for free. It was released back in 2019 on Track's official page. In this documentary, scientist Andrew Stewart finds a new species of snailfish. Yeah, spoiler alert, but had to include it. Now you want to take a look. He said the discovery is beyond words. Yeah, more than fair. Look at this thing. I wouldn't know what to say. He's a squishy tadpole looking rubbery fish. He looks quite sad. And to be fair, when you live 700 meters below in freezing cold water and you don't have much company, yeah, that's... I'd be sad too. That is until Andrew Stewart came along and introduced you to the rest of the world. Now we know what this thing is. Massive eyes, unique color patterns. Not everything down there is terrifying. Just most things, I guess. Number five, Feather Star. Scientific name is Promacochnerus gurgulenus. That's, uh, I tried 17 other times, but we had to cut it out, so that's the best I could do. We'll call it Feather Star. Feather Star is a little bit easier today. And dare I say, that name is quite fitting. Look at him go. He's like a mop head with feelings. He is on a mission. The Feather Star was discovered during the Challenger expedition way back in the early 70s. They're too fast. I mean, like, they're not fast, but they can really move around for what they are. Five centimeters per second. That's, that's pretty fast for an ice-cold crinoid. There's three main parts to this fantastic brain. 
brush, there's the stem, the calyx, and the arms. Now these guys, they self-repair their body parts, which is just insane to me. They'll just yank off one of their arms and just grow a whole new one, like it's no problem. They trap prey. Well, rather, they trap any food particles that float on by. They use their long feathery arms and their natural sticky mucus to catch food and then cycle it through their body. Feather stars reproduce every 10 to 16 months. I have my hands up, like I wanna be a feather star. I don't know why I'm doing this. Hi, I'm like RuPaul. Feather stars reproduce every 10 to 16 months, but it's tricky. Male and female sea stars live in different habitats, right? Different sides of the gymnasium during that first dance, right? They have to kind of get close. They're on opposite ends here. So mating season really has to go swimmingly or else their population is literally at stake. Hope they get along. Number four, growler bear. Yeah, I said growler bear instead of polar bear. What about it? Let's talk. Does this bear do roller derby? Is that where it gets its name from? What's going on? Back in 2006, a Canadian hunter found a hybrid bear. They called it a pizzly bear or a growler bear. You get what I'm doing here. Because it looks like a mix of the two, but it actually was a hybrid. Yeah, tests were later conducted in 2010 after more appeared in Alaska and Northern Canada. Historically, polar bears branched off of grizzlies, you know, like DNA wise way back. Now we're at a point where Arctic areas are warming up and these two species are both traveling further away to find food. So now these two branches are starting to merge back together and in turn we get a growler bear. Which is just fun to say, a growler bear. Number three, Arctic octopus. I watched my octopus teacher last week with Olivia and uh, we both bawled our eyes out. That was a great fun time, that was good, that was a nice date. I didn't know I could get so attached to an octopus. These little guys are fascinating, they dream, they use shells, as tools and like shields, they can camouflage, they have nine brains, eight arms, three hearts, and hundreds of suckers, and one life. I don't know why I added that at the end. I didn't even add that, I was like, oh, we need a one here for this list. Antarctic octopus survive in sub-zero temperatures by using a blue pigment in their blood. They use a natural protein called hemokyanin. They oxygenate their bodies and they adapt to harsh environments, and most importantly, they're really cute. Yeah, look at this little guy. Their appendages are all tight. It keeps it warm and keeps it cozy. That's great. Little arms, oh, I can't even look at him. He's so cute. Get him out of here. Get that guy out of here. I wanna poke him. Number two, basket stars. This next one here is truly a basket case. The basket star, scientific name Gorganocephalus, sounds like a Harry Potter villain, does not look like any type of sea star that we've seen before. Basket stars are brittle stars. They can crawl with these lanky, long appendages. I mean, I would definitely know. This one here was found at 500 meters below sea level. Just walk Walking around like haunted hay, just taking its time, just drifting along. It could also feed by floating along the surface of the water. So next time you take an ice cold dip, watch out you don't run into one of these. Keep your mouth shut when you're swimming. Or you should get one of these brittle, fuzzy things in your mouth. Gross. And coming in at number one, pile of bones. Look, I know this isn't a creature per se, but it's too interesting to leave out. Antarctica is another planet. That place looks like Hoth sometimes, especially in 2016. A team of researchers were working on James Ross Island and they stumbled across 70 million year old fossils. Yeah, what a find. Ancient sea creatures, ancestors of ducks, this thing was a loaded pierogi of history. Researchers have also recently found that 75 million years ago, wildfires were once ripping through Antarctica. How wild is that? Dinosaurs and wildfires. Yeah, a little different than today's Antarctica. Just a, just a tad. Most ancient wildfire evidence has been found in the Northern Hemisphere. So to find the burnt remains of coniferous trees, like charcoal fragments in Antarctica, it reminds us that once upon a time, Antarctica was once fresh when it separated from Gondor it was isolated, it was ice free, most importantly, and it was full of volcanic activity and high oxygen. Tectonic plates were running wild during the Cretaceous period. This was a wild, wild time. Antarctica sure is barren now, but oh boy. Are we lucky that's the case? Scary dinosaurs and fires. No, no, thank you. Thanks for tuning into this part two. If you want a part three, I'll gladly peel back the layers of time and talk about ancient bugs any day. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and I'll see you next time on Most Amazing Top 10. Deuces. <coughs> 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 whizzing through this. Vodka. This is full of vodka. I'll never tell. Finally got that Yeti to put some of that Johnny Depp red wine in there. Just fill her up. Scientific name is, here we go. Promacochrinus. Prama oh, Promacochrinus. Maybe not Maybe. Promacochrinus. Oh, Promacho. <laughs> This guy chokes people out with his feathers. Promachocrinus. Oh, Promachocrinus. Promachoc. Oh, man. Promachocrinus. And then Ker Kerguglanus. F man. They tap. What? Oh, they tap prey? They're like, hey. What the f they use a natural protein called Hamo. Huh? Hey. I'm like, hey. Hey, Hamokyanin. It's crazy. Sarah's right there. She's pointing at me right now. This is so intimidating. I'm like, huh? Number one. <clears throat>